Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming today. We are the Senate Civic League, and we have organized an event that is a pre-election public forum on trying to engage voters in what's, ha what's coming up. So I want to um, let Don Anderson, Don Anderson and I, my name is Chris McLaren, and I'm the chair of the Senate Civic League currently, and we have a very enthusiastic group of, uh, of executive committee members, and they're here today. I want to just introduce Caleb um, Horn at the back, David Squantz uh, beside him, Linda Sproul Jones, and Don Anderson, and myself, and we've got a few people Carol. missing. Oh, Carol Pickup, thank you very much. So, um, I want to just introduce Don Anderson. He's going to do a little of the introduction and sort of the housekeeping stuff, and then we're going to get, get started. Thanks very much for coming, everybody, today. And with the sunshine happening and all those other events happening, I sure appreciate being here. So, I'm going to turn it over to Don Anderson. Um, thank you, and welcome. And just uh, a few things we want to go over before we start. Um, you all have agendas, so you've got a rough idea of what's going to happen this afternoon. But I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what we do as the Senate Civic League. We're a volunteer organization. We're a nonpartisan organization. And what we're really about is engaging people in the electoral process. Um, as you would have seen from some of the news reports and some of the materials we've put out, participation at the municipal level is very low, uh, something around 20%. It's not unusual. We, we point to Saanich, because that's where we live and that's what we're about. But that's not unusual around the province. So really engaging people at the civic level is a really tough task. and it's. And that's part of what we want to do. We want to get people talking to each other about what matters to their neighborhoods and their community and their city. And we want to get them out and voting because that's really what this is all about. It's all about getting people to participate and getting our elected representatives to respond to that participation and that engagement in the process. So what, our, what we want to get out of this is really a motivation of people to engage in their community. Go out and talk to your neighbors, get them engaged in the electoral process. And who they vote for is really not the point here. The point is that we get out and vote. So then, what we want out of the electoral process is really an improvement in our quality of life, an improvement in where we live, how we react to each other, and how we address the issues that we share in common. So what we have for you this afternoon are three panelists that um, are going to make presentations to you on some different aspects of municipal governance, and municipal government, and the issues that, that we face in the municipality. Then we're going to break into smaller groups where we can have a discussion. We can bring your ideas to your neighbors, and we'll take a little recording of that, and then we'll come back into a larger group again where we can have that discussion and engage with the panelists and look for perhaps solutions or new ideas on how we can deal with some of the common issues <coughs> we share. Um, just the basic housekeeping things. If you have a cell phone, if you can leave it on mute, and if you need to take the calls, if you just step outside, that would be very helpful. Um, the washrooms are down the hallway, and down to your right. Um, uh, we need that. Um, we're going to have a refreshment break, so we'll have coffee and tea and water in the back. And um, please help yourself and engage uh, socially for a few minutes between the presentations by the panelists and our little break into um, to our. Uh, discussion groups. And stick around, because there are prizes, so if you make it through to 4 o'clock, you're going to have a prize, a door prize, so uh, please uh, make sure you stay around for that as well. Now, the next task that I have is to introduce someone I think you're probably all very familiar with, and, and she will act as our, uh, as our MC for the rest of the afternoon, Charlie Bearser. And uh, Charlie is no stranger uh, to elections or the electoral process. She has uh, served, I think as many of you probably know, on the Victoria School Board, two terms as chair of that school board, uh, brought some very important issues to the fore, especially dealing with uh, inner city schools, uh, with the uh, issues that uh, kids around bullying, especially those who are sexual orientation was being challenged. And so she did a lot of work on that and um, I think spread across the province and certainly um, if not across the country. Um, she continues now to work um, in, in dealing with governance issues. She's the executive director of the Columbia Institute. She deals with civic governance, um, climate change, what municipalities can do around social justice issues. And it really provides a, a schooling, uh, a leadership role for uh, municipal politicians. 
Charlie's here with us from Victoria today. She spends much of her week in Vancouver dealing with the Columbia Institute. Um, but we're very, very, very happy to have her. <coughs> very fortunate to have her join, her today, join us today. Please, Charlie. about joining us on this glorious day when there are so many other choices out there. Uh, Don started off his comments by making a, a reference to low voter turnout in uh, municipal elections. And I want to pause to uh, uh, make some kudos to the Saanich Civic League and, and in particular to Sharon Morgan's uh, work last time around. Because as I recall the numbers properly, the voting participation in Saanich went from 17% to 19%. Now, if you break that down in percentage terms, that's actually a 10% boost. That's pretty darn good. So, some kudos there. Uh, engaged citizenry certainly makes for a better community, a stronger, healthier community. And uh, as we are dealing with the uh, issues of the day, the large issues of the day, there really is some, some underpinning to the title that you've chosen here, The Future is Local. I think that's really lovely. I think it captures it beautifully. And your panel here today has some very good representation because on your panel we have a farmer, we have somebody who specializes in public policy at the university, and we have a planner. So it's a really good, uh, a really good threesome. And uh, before I give you a few more details about them, just a couple of uh, things for them. You have 15 minutes. Would you like me to give you a cue at about one minute so that you know that you're coming close to the end of your representation? All right. So I'm going to start right here with my lovely farmer, Elmarie Roberts. Uh, just a few things about her. She's a farmer and a member of the board of directors at Halliburton Farms Community Organic Farm. She grows a variety of vegetables, edible flowers, fruits, herbs, and saves certified organic seeds. Before her entry into farming, she taught ESL in South Africa. She worked in community support services in Victoria and operated a retail business in downtown Victoria. She continues as a shareholder of a succession planning and knowledge man management systems company. And she's just completed a four-year lease on a one-acre farm at, at Halliburton Farm, one-acre Halliburton Farm. She's going to be fabulous. Um, now, I think I'll give you your descriptions all at once, and then we'll come back and hear from them. So in the middle, we have Dr. Michael Prince, and the uh, description from Michael's bio that is probably the most apropos is social transformer. Uh, so Michael, many presentations, keynotes, opinion, offer, uh, opinion editorials, as well as his class. And here's the underpinnings for it. He joined UVic in 1987 as the inaugural Lansdowne Professor of Social Policy, and from 1997 to 2005, he served as Associate Dean and Dean of the Faculty of Human and Social Development, and most recently was the recipient of the UVic Community Leadership Award. He certainly is a well-known commentator, so welcome, Michael. And next to him is our planner, James Van Hemert. And James has joined HP Lanark, which is a, which is a company that's getting a lot of profile for uh, community planning and uh, climate action plans around the province. He's a former director of the Rocky Mountain Land Use Institute in Denver, uh, and he's an author of a book called True West, Authentic Development Patterns for Small Towns and Rural Areas. It sounds fabulous. And uh, just another note, his favorite land use is coffee shop. <laughs> So, uh, without ado, we are going to ask Elle Marie to begin uh, your 15 minutes. Thank you. While I, while I wait for this to warm up, I am just um, very inspired today and honored to acknowledge that the land we're standing on 
um, has been paved by the hunters and growers of long ago. And um, they were the true food security experts. Many food security experts are in the room today. They, they grow in their own backyards and on their patios, small scale farms. I'm inspired by all of them. I'm um, going to talk today about food security in Saanich and as it, um, in particular the role of uh, this commu little community farm that, that came to be uh, in 2002. And we affectionately refer to it as Hallie and it's a short for Halliburton Farm. We're all hor horrified at the name because Halliburton has associations to gun factories and um, it's, it's not very good, so we all refer to it as Halley. Um, it's on Halliburton Road in, in Saanich and the website of the same name is easily accessible and provides extensive history to, to the background of this farm. Please consult that. I, I, I was looking at the actual definition of food security and it, it has main threats. The main threats are accessibility to food, affordability, has to be sufficient, and has to be pure, safe and nutritious. Those are the, the golden threads. So I'd just like to speak to the potential role of community farming to these values. Immediately you might want to consider the difference between a community farm and, and a convention, conventional farm. A community farm is very similar to a co-op model. A group of people come together, farm together on one piece of land, in a nutshell. And the word community is very important. Can you all hear me? Sorry. Um, there are fundamental success factors of a community farm. I've come to know them over the last eight years and I would like to, to speak to some of them and how this has worked in my experience. Immediately, um, it's land. And I'm so happy that we have councillors here from Saanich today because the land belongs to the municipality of the, the district of Saanich. Uh, in 2002, there was an application to remove land from the Agricultural Land Reserve and um, the Cordoba Bay Association, a group of concerned citizens, the Linking Land and Local Farmers Group and neighbours came together. People who paid attention to agricultural land applications, uh, an application to remove land from the Agricultural Land Reserve. And we all put on our suits and we went to Sandwich, asked them if they could please grow food on this piece of land instead of building condominiums there. It showed a lot of vision way back then to agree to do this and we were forever thankful to the district for doing that. They purchased the land from the CRD and then um, gave us the tall order to grow food and to administer this piece of property, it's nine acres. I'll speak to all of these as I come. I first just wanted to let you know what my uh, talk is going to uh, include. It's going to include these uh, success factors of community farming and um, in understanding its role in supporting food security. So the first one, it's also finances, definitely farmers, knowledge and communication, the community and social contribution. So I'll just briefly speak to, to each one. I started on the land and um, the history as I mentioned is on our website. The land is then administered by the Halliburton Community Organic Farm Society, a non-profit and a board of directors. It's also um, we answer to Saanich on an annual basis by providing an annual report which includes our financial um, report as well. The society then leases it to five farmers. There are five farms on the property. Each is about one acre 
um, based on the business model that you can, one person can easily make a profit of at least $10,000 on one, uh, one acre without heavy machinery. And I, I, that can be easily doubled and tripled if there are more people involved. I'm personally speaking to one person. The land is then uh, leased to these farmers and as an incentive to them it's leased at a very minimal amount of around $500 a year. They, they sign an agreement with the society to, to be there for five years. At the end of five years they have the option to renew or to pass it on to another farmer. And um, in turn this agreement is then also in our agreement with Saanich, we have an agreement with the district too. At the end of five years, um, one has a very good idea of what farming is like and whether you would like to make this your, your model. So the, there's a lot of um, your, your way of life. There's a, a lot of support on, on a community farm. It's an incubation model and that is primarily what Alibertan serves at them, and I would say that is its success. We support each other in, in many ways and land being accessible to farmers who would like to start out today is extremely important. I'd like to, um, I read Michael's um, article in the Times columnist yesterday. And that's when I added these words in my presentation. I think the district addressed the urban issue of food security by providing land. So that's one way they can do it. We've been approached by many people to, for this model, how is this working? Um, Colwood was there the other day. They have willing farmers, but they don't have land. Uh, some people from the northern districts of, of BC were there. They have land, but no farmers. So it's, um, there's a, there's a, some, it points to something. This community farm, um, there are 14 at the last count, which, which was quite a while ago, 14 community farms in Canada, and seven of them are on Vancouver Island. So immediately I wondered about that, and the answer came. It's infectious, this food security thing. This passion for growing food is incredibly infectious and it's evident in people's lives, in, in their healthy lifestyles. And I think that is what makes Vancouver Island special. It, it, it is rubbing off, off on, on everyone around us. Of course the finances, to most important things farmers want today, land, and how are they going to ever make a living out of this. We operate on a grant of around $5,000 from the district annually, and that largely goes towards the center. We inherited a house which we call the center. Um, nobody lives there, it's used for board meetings, it's used to wash the farmer produce, and we have also rented it out to chefs. So it's used for the utilities there. And um, we also apply annually for a community matching grant. With this money we've put in an orchard. We've uh, expanded a chip trail. Eventually we would like an interpretive trail through the farm. And that would save farmers from dropping whatever they're doing whenever somebody arrives and asks what is going on here. So um, the community matching grant, and that's all. We operate by volunteers, there's no farm manager. We, um, we have a consensus board and um, we have to apply for grants. If we don't have time, we don't apply for grants. So we badly um, need volunteers and our board, um, we require our board to specifically someone to be there that can apply for grants every year because if that doesn't happen, there's no, there are no finances coming in. Each 
small business, each, uh, they have their own business. This is how they make a living. We share the farm stand, we sell at Moss Street Market. We have a very successful food box program. It started with 10 people in its first year, and it's now up to 50. People come to the farm Wednesdays and Fridays, and they pick up a box of certified organic food, and that is the way that they can support the farmers. To me, it's true community support agriculture this year, because people are actually coming there and watching where the food's growing there. They participate in growing it. Um, we need a lot of marketing to be done. Nobody knows, not many people know about the farm. Um, we would like to talk to people about why you, you don't have to buy a lot of food when it's purely grown, grown in a very pure way, because it's nutritionally dense. And um, we don't have time for that, too busy growing, growing food. Um, we would like to see more st strategically placed farm stands and markets across town, everywhere, where we can sell our produce. There's no question that uh, this farm hinges on the backbone of the farmers. They are very, very important. Without them, there would be no farm. Um, the, there are more potential farmers growing every day. In the last two years especially, it was amazing. In 2002, we did not have farmers. I dropped whatever I was doing at the time and said, okay, I'll do it. So I went and studied organic farming as a business and um, along with two wonderful other people farmed, actually farmed the land. Last year, when some of the leases came to an end and requests for proposals went out, we were inundated with applications. Young people are so eager to learn. This is the first year that the farm is being worked to its full capacity. It's wonderful to see the energy and the t-shirts that the mom sent the, the young farmers. One was wearing a t-shirt this, this week that said, Live, Love, Farm. <laughs> <laughs> so knowledge is very important. Um, practical sharing, I believe in learning by doing, especially with farming, there's nothing like it. Um, easily accessible knowledge and affordable resources. Uh, not everybody can, they want to farm, but there's some knowledge, especially on the certified organic farm, knowledge needs to be passed on. And we're looking at ways of accomplishing that by inviting the nearby school, practical students, work experience students, we are on the Volunteer Victoria website, which is very, very valuable. And this year, it's the first year that I have time to, to spend with community groups, and I'm really enjoying it, seeing that civic engagement. So the community is, is key. The board, Volunteer is very knowledgeable board. There's a wetland, one of our, um, uh, board members who spearheads the wetland um, restoration is a previous uh, professor at UPIC. We um, have neighbors that are very involved and we're building relationships at the farm stand on a weekly basis. It's served as a pivotal place for people to, to address the disconnectedness in society. Social contribution, we have little van drives up there once a week from the Our Place Society and they pick up whatever we, we have in excess and we also have taken our produce down to the Blanchard Community Centre and other places. It's um, a very big part of what we do, we have grow rows and we continuously answering requests for donations. In conclusion, I'd like to say that Saving green and grow spaces are key. Please provide us incentives and funding for growers of food. Market local. Coordinate food security and follow through with succession. Succession is incredibly important. We've seen so many people leave and they take all that knowledge with them. It's, um, it's, it's a valuable way of leaving a legacy. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was very uh, interesting, and you didn't even need your prompt.
out. Um, I would like to call uh, Michael Prince uh, to come. And just to let you know, if you hang on to your questions until the end of the presentation, so there will be some time at the end there. Um, before we go any further, do you There was the, shall I do some introductions? Yes, I think Okay. They have. The nominations closed yesterday, the 14th, for the municipal campaigns. And I noticed that we do have a number of people here who are, who are going to be candidates. So I'm going to actually start from this side of the room and ask you to stand up and introduce yourself and uh, say where you're running. Judy Brownoff, I'm running for Senate Council again and the CRD. Anybody else on this side of the room? David Braxer, I'm running for school board trustee in the Greater Victoria School District, which actually includes uh, the lower half of Santa Fe, Big Low Road. Edith Lauren Kovanga, I'm a current trustee of Santa Fe School District, but I'm switching to Victoria and I'm running for the Victoria School District. Uh, Sanish Council Paul Gerard, running for re election to Sanish Council and CRE. Hi, I'm Vic Derman. I'm running for re-election as a science counselor and as a CRD director. Uh, I'm Rob Wixon. I'm running for the second time uh, as a science counselor and a CRD director.
If there had been more people who were candidates, uh, I might have spent a bit more time on just talking about what is municipal governments, but I, I won't uh, belabor that point too much. Uh, I guess one observation is municipal governments are extremely varied. And when you look at the 13 across the capital regional district, uh, that's a, we're a good example of what's typical across British Columbia and the rest of the country. Uh, I'll, I'll do five P's just so you can remember for an election. Uh, first, municipal government is about people, obviously. Um, so municipalities are a form of social organization. The size of councils are roughly uh, to be meant to reflect the size of the populations, although that's not always true. So we've got uh, in New Royal, for example, four councillors and a mayor. Uh, in Oakville, we have the six councillors plus the mayor. And in San in Victoria, we have eight councillors plus the mayor. And, uh, so you, you get the sense they're trying to get some representation by a population, not always easy. Uh, but municipalities across the country vary from really just a few hundred to, uh, in Toronto's case, close to three million people now. Uh, municipalities are about place, um, defined territories, whether that's a natural environment, uh, an indigenous territory, such as here where you get this placed on sailors for sailors' uh, lands, and it's a sanitary nation. Peninsula. Again, municipalities vary tremendous in size. And whether they're built up and developed, as is Oak Bay, or in the case of Sandwich, where we still have some interesting issues and choices around rural and agricultural lands and urban and suburban. And, uh, and out in the western communities, of course, uh, Langford with the pressures of growth and New Royal and the Highlands and so forth. Uh, so, depending on where you live, some of these issues are quite pressing. Uh, quite frankly, in other areas, uh, most of the development issues uh, that we face at uh, Saanich or Langford have already been resolved one way or another, for better or for worse, because it's a built up, densified area. Uh, local governments about politics, of course. Um, and by that I mean you know, neighborhood associations. And Saanich has a vibrant network of uh, several uh, community and neighborhood associations. But I was delighted to see on the Saanich website already I think half a dozen all candidates meetings organized and planned over the course of the next several weeks uh, for Saanich Council. I think that's tremendous. That speaks to uh, a vitality of civic engagement in Saanich. And a nice way of challenge to the other municipalities and to citizens of the other municipalities and their neighborhood association. I know in Oak Bay, I think there's two planned and in other in Victoria would be a number as well. Uh, municipalities about power. Uh, as a legal corporation, uh, and as I mentioned in my little op-ed the other morning, uh, municipalities, as you know, are sometimes called creations or creatures of the provinces. They do not enjoy sovereign powers like provinces or the federal government. Their powers are all delegated under municipal acts or other kinds of provincial legislation. Uh, but I wanted to make the case in the op-ed that that does not mean that they're simply uh, buffeted by the winds of provinces. Uh, there's a lot of capacity and tremendous, I think more fundamentally, legitimacy in local government. Uh, that often the higher levels of government are losing or have lost I think, <coughs> in the eyes of many Canadians. Uh, but we can't take it for granted. It's a cherished value. But I think the accessibility uh, of councillors, uh, the relatively more openness of municipal council functions, uh, and many people would say, uh, perhaps the most important day-to-day -day functions that any government does is those done by their municipality when they reflect on it for a minute or two. So the puzzle is why don't we 20% vote then? Uh, and maybe that's something we can talk about later today. The last P is programs and services and, uh, and plans, like official community plans or the regional growth strategies. Uh, and, and with that, I think we need to do a better job, I'm glad we've got candidates here today, to explain to our neighbors, our friends, the interaction between plans and variances. Because often a lot of groups get angry or upset. If you've got a plan, why don't you stick to it and never alter it? There's that view of an official plan. I think a more realistic one is life happens. <laughs> Opportunities, challenges, threats, whatever happens. How many variances or too many variances to compromise the integrity of the community plan? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think there is an answer, but it all is about context and time and content. But uh, we need to explain better how the local government operates and <coughs> things like variance permits and so forth are a legitimate part of government and about making choices. Uh, quality development, quality, sustainable. 
So put those all together, those P's, people, place, politics, powers, and programs and plans, and that other P's, uh, you end up with issues, choices, and values. Uh, and again, I think tomorrow's Times columnist, uh, I don't work for them, by the way, <laughs> uh, will be a major issue. You know, perhaps over the last, well, you all know, because you're candidates and you're here. Uh, They've been asking people to email in what their thoughts are and what are the civic issues that concern you the most. And they listed a couple of times uh, 15 or 20 categories of topic areas. Uh, well, the results are in and uh, they've got their top five and they're going to do a major piece tomorrow on uh, what those are. And, uh, uh, of course, those vary. Uh, that's not a scientific sample. It's whoever decided to email in the phone or share their thoughts. But, uh, uh, of course, it's sanitized would be a slightly different complexion of issues than what it would be in both day. Uh, so the nominations are closed yesterday. Uh, so for the 13 councils, uh, 13 mayors, we've got three acclaimed mayors. Uh, we'll have four new, at least four new mayors, uh, places like Oak Bay. Places like Saanich, we have incumbents facing interesting competitions and challenges uh, in the other six. So, that will set the tone, I think, across the different 13 municipalities as to how racist may be. If I'm reading it right, Highland is an incredibly remarkable phenomenon this year. Uh, the mayors are claimed as are all six councillors. Nobody else is running in Highland. I can't think of another time when that's happened. Maybe you know, but that to me is New Royal. Royal, thank you very much. <laughs> you my experts here, thank you. I wasn't going to dare to say, this has never happened before in the history of. Thank you very much. Uh, friendly heckles break. Uh, so we've got that. We've got, uh, up, when you look at the 13 councils, that's up to 70 councillor seats. Uh, 58 incumbents are running again. Uh, so 83% of incumbents decided to come back and throw the hat at again. And many of you in this room are, are long time uh, participants and servers for your communities. Uh, there's 74 uh, new candidates running. So there's 132 people running for these 70 positions. I think that's, again, a testament to the vitality and the interest and the sense of relevance of local government uh, to people. So again, why isn't that turnout higher? Because I think when we look at who's running and how many, and, and uh, the modest number of acclamations, uh, disregarded or putting Thailand aside for a second, but uh, in Saanich, for example, seven of eight incumbents running again, five other uh, candidates throwing their hat in the ring for a very, uh, the mayor facing two other uh, contenders and a real race there, as in other municipalities. The four school districts, we've got a couple that I've mentioned here, so the Great Victoria, the Saanich, uh, the Soup School Board, and the Gulf of Islands. Again, there's dozens of other candidates for those trustee positions. Uh, I spent a whole other workshop on that. Uh, so let me just say a few minutes of remarks about, um, again, this would have been for the other people in the room who aren't the candidates or the <laughs> organizers or friends and family. Uh, and maybe this is more for the video or for the record. Uh, but learning more about the candidates in your municipality. Uh, see if they have a website. Uh, that's almost de rigueur now. They must have a, a website. Check the municipal websites. Again, tremendous variety across the 13 as to how helpful, useful, some are pretty flashy. Uh, uh, others, it's not so easy to find municipal council or mayor. Others, it pops right up. Uh, it's, it's a mystery in other places. Uh, collect and read the brochures and the flyers and the advertisements uh, that candidates put up. Scan your local and community newspapers. If you're really keen, go back on computer and do a, a word search for issues or votes of past council. Uh, Sam Civically has done nice work on that for Saanich, but uh, regrettably for most other municipalities in the region, there's not that kind of function or service done or for the CRD. Chat with your friends and neighbors. Uh, I got involved in politics as, as a kid because my, my parents talked about it. And I think, again, the message for those of you who aren't politically active, <laughs> is there anybody here? <laughs> uh, how to get the vote up? Uh, talk about it. You know, I, you know, I would say when you go to a party, particularly when you're invited to new friends, don't bring up sex or religion or politics. You don't know these people. Uh, but for goodness sake, and you might not want to talk about sex or drugs or rock and roll with your kids, but talk politics for goodness sakes. Uh, 
be surprised what you might find in terms of common. And, and it's still early on that, that it's uh, part, of, part of life, part of growing up, part of being a community. I tend to more of the old candidates' meetings that are organized. Uh, don't always trust the write ups <laughs> about the old candidates' meetings. So you can go. So I, uh, just a few reflections. Uh, you'll give me a signal chart. A common feature I find in the flyers, the brochures, and the bio of the candidates, especially for incumbents, perhaps the present company excluded, is to list all the committees you've been a member of. Half the time, that might take up half the flyer. I've been on this and this and this and this. Now, this may or may not tell us much of what you want to know about the person. Depending on how committee assignments are decided upon or allocated in a municipality, and again, I don't know all the details of Spanish, but I'm generalizing here, uh, the actual memberships of committees may or may not be a reflection uh, of that person's own interests and passions. It may be more a reflection of the mayor's preferences or the seniority of the people on the last council or some other factors. So it's unclear, I think, what and how listing of committee memberships tells us about an incumbent candidate's contributions. So I think in addition to knowing about what their community membership or committee memberships are, it may say something about where they sat and what the minutes were that were taken. But where do they stand on the issues? And on what were the issues that the hours were given to? Forget the minutes of the meetings. What was their voting record on those issues? Now, past voting records could be a good predictor, uh, not a perfect predictor. I see Linda Bill Jones in the room, and we used to work together. We would do interview with hires, and we always try to ask experiential based questions to candidates for job applications, because we think the best predictor of how someone will do in the next job is how they did it in the last job. So let's ask them. So voting records aren't a bad predictor. Uh, they're not perfect, because voting patterns can and do shift. Politicians have been known to change their minds. Um, uh, if, if new issues come up, or where if new information comes to light, or where suddenly there's a shift in the stakeholders and some new strong community input shifts the tone and the nature of the debate. Um, and there's nothing wrong with changing your mind, changing your opinion. Perhaps it's easier in local government than it is to party discipline at the provincial and federal governments where uh, for some bizarre reason we still think that's a mortal sin that you're allowed to think a second time and change your mind. So I asked your incumbent candidates, uh, candidates what do you believe were the two or three most important achievements you did at the last council? How did you contribute to those achievements or decisions? <clears throat> How many times have you met with community associations or other local groups? And for what purpose and with what results? <clears throat> Why are you running again? That's the obvious question. What do you see as the ongoing issues? In your opinion, what's the unfinished business that you want to do? What are the emerging opportunities or the challenges facing our municipality and our capital region. Now, for the few new candidates who aren't incumbents here, uh, uh, as, as I say, it's uh, in addition to seven incumbents running in the eight spots, there's five other candidates who are, who are uh, new. Ask them also why are they running for council? What's motivated them in deciding to stand for municipal office? What do they see as the key issues facing Sanch? Or neighborhoods or areas of them. What skills and knowledge do they bring to the job and to these issues? Uh, so I'll leave it there. Those are just some thoughts. And I didn't want to get into a detail of the history of Municipal Government 101. Uh, I did, did be given this room. But I look forward to the format of the rest of the day, the group discussion, and I know there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. Mm -hmm. Thanks.
that they, they have an important place in history and in political movements and in promoting democracy. But just a few interesting facts here about coffee shops. You probably know they're already somewhat countercultural. If you visit some of the, the coffee shops in Victoria and Saanich, they have a certain character that's sometimes bohemian. Uh, and in, uh, in France, they played a key role in the French Enlightenment. And in England, uh, in jolly old England, uh, King Charles II at one time tried to suppress London coffee houses as places where the disaffected met and spread scandalous reports concerning the conduct of his majesty and his ministers. <laughs> but I, I just mentioned coffee shops. Not only do I happen to really like coffee shops, but I think they are very important places in a democratic society. Uh, and they continue to play an important role in political discourse. Now, now more to the topic here on farming. And I'm, I'm going to spend more time on farming than normally, normally would, and that is because of the, the topics at hand and the keen interest in food security, and we heard about the Halliburton Farms. Uh, we moved to Vancouver Island, my wife and I, uh, not too long ago, and one of the reasons we came here was to farm. Now, I, my wife is the farmer, and I have to bring home a salary to support her farming habit. <laughs> um, I think there's a resonance here that's true. Farming is it's very difficult to make a living farming. In fact, a farmer was once asked how he could make, how would you make a small, how would you make a large fortune in farming? Well, he said, I would just start farming, and I would start with a large fortune and keep farming until it was a small fortune. <laughs> so, I'm going to elevate agriculture into one of what I see three key systems operating in a place like Sandwich. One is um, represented by hogs, and that's agriculture. But the second is represented by dogs, and that's our urban, our human settlements. And of course, we bring dogs and everything that's uh, uh, the, the, some of the conflicts inherent in having dogs. And then finally, the uh, frogs, which represents the natural environment. And a key principle that, I, that I'd like to emphasize and that I want you to think about, and I think that helps you think about a lot of the smaller issues, is to preserve the integrity and the vitality of those three systems. The, the natural, the man-made, the urban settlements, and then the agricultural. I think agriculture has become so important now that we recognize here, especially on Vancouver Island and in places like Santa, that agriculture isn't something that happens out there. Uh, we realize now, increasingly so, that it must happen nearby. And yet, I don't think that on Vancouver Island we're producing more than 10% of our own food. We used to present, we used to produce a much higher. Maybe it's only 5%? Yeah, that's not encouraging. Uh, we need to change that. And I'm going to introduce a few ideas about how we can change that. Uh, and I, I want to change the last half of my uh, title. To the, to the talk. When I, when I talked with Don about titling this and when he made the request uh, for me to speak and talk about some of the conflict at the rural-urban interface, it's a lot more complex than that. In fact, I looked at, uh, looking at the rural area in, in, your, in your official community plan, so you have a local area plan for rural sandwich. So tell me, where is the urban-rural interface on this map? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crossword puzzle. It's bits and pieces. And in fact, I think that that's reflects much more the reality in many places. I have often thought that we should have cleaner lines between the rural and the agricultural areas and the urban areas. But in fact, that's not our reality. And so I think it's even more important that we find ways to help make those coexist. So I'm going to cover these three areas, and I have a few points under each one, and I'm going to start with hogs. By the way, I, I reviewed this outline with my son just before I came here. Now, he is, he is almost a farmer in Victoria. He works for Petal to Petal, which is an organic pickup service. Anybody heard about it? Yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> okay, it's gaining a lot of popularity, uh, and it's, it's a piece of that agricultural system. Um, but his comment was, we want hogs in Victoria. 
maybe we should allow for pigs on some larger lots. Um, but my point here, uh, I'm going to cover a few of them. Support traditional community practices that support agriculture. Some of those might not be seen as real pretty or they might not smell as nice as you might like to think. Uh, urbanites in particular like the countryside, but we want it to look nice and smell nice. But that's not really the case all the time, is it? So I think we have to think about agriculture in all of its dimensions. And I think we in the urban areas need to be a little bit more tolerant of some of those aspects of agriculture. I need to support them. Uh, my second point is to protect agricultural land. Now, Sanich already has done an extraordinary job doing that. My understanding from reading your OCP is that um, virtually no land has been removed out of the ALR in, in dozens of years. Um, and I think that's a great testament to the, not only to what the province did with establishing the ALR, but the, the, the political, um, the elected officials have stood firm and not supported applications to move it. A Halliburton farm is a good example. I think that's an excellent example of putting your money where your mouth is. Um, but it's not just enough to preserve that land, because as we know, that land is so expensive. We can't just let it out to the market and hope that things will happen productively. But in fact, we have to assist it in a variety of ways, whether it's through the, the supply, make sure that the infrastructure for to support farming continues, that the markets continue, and to view it as a working landscape. It's not just a pretty place, but it's a working landscape that needs all the infrastructure support from, from the uh, all fair to the ability to set up a market stand and the ability to farm as, as you need to do, even if that means working late at night and making a lot of noise. Uh, allow, and this is the third point on this, allow a broad range of permitted uses in rural agricultural areas. Uh, there are many elements of farming, especially those that may bring in more money, that communities often put their thumbs down on. And, and I'll put this out there, I think it's appropriate, uh, provided we meet the provincial guidelines, that, um, that some animal processing and uh, slaughtering occur, even on very small farms. Uh, I think we need to open this up more. It's very expensive to have to go take your hog or, or your chickens to a special special place to have them butchered and taken care of. This used to all happen on farms. Um, that's just an example of, of something that probably should have a little bit more leniency around. A fourth, limit permitting fees and approval processes. For, for, for agricultural buildings and processes, I think we really need to support them financially as much as possible and make it easy to get things done. I know where I live in Cowichan Bay, where we have our small farm. Um, we're allowed for agricultural buildings for, to, to put one up, we merely have to submit a $100 site plan. That's the only fee we have. So for barns and other outbuildings, that's it. I think that's quite reasonable. Uh, fifth, buy local. And this, is, this isn't as much of a planning, well, it, it can be a planning issue, and I'll explain why in a moment, but we need to support our farmers by buying their food, even if it's a bit more expensive. And maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but I think the more we can do at the local government level, and the more we can do as citizens to support local produce, the better off we are, because farmers need a market. Uh, we heard about the challenge that Halliburton Farm has. Farmers aren't all, they may be good at farming, but they may not be so good at marketing. Uh, so those are my points on hogs. Now on frogs. This is, uh, this is a bit of a paradigm shift for some of you, but that is to view the city, the city itself, the urban areas, as a forest. Now I don't just mean the trees. I'm thinking of view the city as its own ecosystem. And not only the human social ecosystem of our city functions, but that the city itself can be a place where we, we produce a lot of good quality habitat for wildlife. And maybe we'll, well, there's problems with urban habitat, right? Whether it's the rabbits or the deer, but we need to find the balance. And it's hard because some of the natural predators are gone, but it is, an eco, it is a natural ecosystem. And we have an impact on the water supply. And if we begin to see the city as a forest, we can begin to see how that's, how we can integrate with the natural system and we can have a higher quality of life in an urban environment that in fact begin, that functions like a natural system. 
So that's everything from managing our stormwater in a more natural way to ensuring that our landscaping has a wide variety of plants in it. Perhaps we can even require our developers that they plant fruit trees or a wider variety, not, not just the standard, um, what is it, the, um, the, the golden, the, the, uh, the cedar, uh, the emerald cedars. We, we need to have a wide variety of plants. And it, it, it's a different frame of looking at how the city operates. And by the way, just take that one step further, or one step further down. See buildings and things like a tree. See the building as having ecological functions. There are buildings now being put up in Europe, and we're seeing some in British Columbia where they're actually producing more energy than they consume. They're, they're soaking up rainwater because there's gardens on the roof. Um, it's, it's a new way, it's, I think it's a new way of, of looking at the urban environment. Uh, my second point on the frogs. Protect environmentally sensitive and ecologically important lands in connected and unfragmented patterns. The more we can connect our natural areas, our parks, uh, and our agricultural lands, the better off we are because wildlife movement depends on it and it's just a healthier way to maintain that environment. Um, I realize in Sandwich that a lot of the, the decisions have already been made in this regard, but there may be decisions in the future that can be made that connect these, these pieces. And three, provide easy access to nature. I think you have here, and this is true on many parts of Vancouver Island, nature isn't very far away. Um, but the more accessible we can make it, the better it is for our kids. We now have a generation which is growing up indoors. Um, kids today say, well, I prefer to play indoors because that's where all the electrical outlets are. <laughs> kids don't get nearly the amount of playtime outdoors as they used to. And you know, we run them around to sports events, uh, but that's not really access. That's not really the kind of access to nature that kids have uh, or need. Uh, for protect water quality, I think it's very important. As, as you're looking at buildings as part of a natural system, uh, the green infrastructure that mimics the natural hydrologic processes, you know, we spent millions and billions of dollars in North America on outdoor plumbing systems, which have actually done a lot of harm to the environment because we're not cleaning the water anymore. Uh, it's and, and all the old streams, many, a lot of cities now, you can find maps of cities where all the streams are buried. Uh, some communities are unburied those streams to recreate that. Uh, it's, been done in, it's been done in Korea and it's been done in the States. I don't know of Canadian examples, but it's a recognition of the important functions that those drainage areas and those streams held. Uh, restrict pesticides on lawns and gardens. Uh, that's something to consider. Toronto did it. Uh, Maybe that's a step that needs to be taken here in, in the Victoria region. Uh, limit impervious surfaces. Uh, fewer parking spaces, for example, and more bicycle lanes. An automobile-dominated urban pattern doesn't work well for the natural environment because we cover so much in pavement. An inter interesting little factoid here. How many, anybody have any sense of how many free parking spaces exist for every owned it's about that. It's between five and seven. Nobody really knows for sure. But think about the environmental cost of all those parking spaces. Uh, some of these other points I've already made, so I'm going to talk about dogs. <laughs> Support and enhance complete urban functions. Of course, you know I'm talking about cities. And urban environments, not just the dogs. But when I say complete, I mean the full range of uses that we need in our day-to-day -day lives as citizens. And our zoning code, our zoning bylaws, often reflect an unnatural state of affairs. So we have this zoning category called single-family residential. And in many communities, we've, we've, we've made huge areas that are only single-family, or maybe even two-family. But you can't go to your job or you go to the corner store in that area, right? Because it's not zoned for. So it, it's more extreme as you go further out you know, in development beyond post-World post War II development is particularly that way. And it's not a complete community, so you're forced to get into your car to go places. So my, the point I'm making is that if we look back before when, when we got around on streetcars or in the rural areas and we had small hamlets, we created complete communities. 
So that's another thing to think about in, in creating a complete urban system or, or even rural system that the services are available nearby. My second point, and my, my, my son said, you're at it again, Dad. <laughs> density, support density. One of the, and this can be, this can be very challenging and this can be uh, very controversial, but higher densities mean there's less land left for agriculture and natural systems. And in fact, promoting higher density, and I'm not talking about West End Vancouver with all high rises. You can look at Amsterdam, or even Victoria as a great example of very livable, comfortable pedestrian oriented density. Um, that is the compact living high of that kind of density, five, six, seven stories. It's probably one of the <coughs> best ways to look for a green future in terms of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, and saving the land for agriculture and natural systems. Uh, and that, of course, leads to the uh, maintaining the historic development patterns. Recognize those historic development patterns when you look at changes in infill um, opportunities within the city. And I was going to make this point, and I, I'm less convinced about this now when I understand a little bit more about Saanich, and that is maintaining a distinct edge to intense urban development. In some ways, that's ideal, but it's very difficult to maintain a distinct edge. But the value of a distinct edge is that it stops here and there's less conflict. Because if it's all helter-skelter and hopscotch, uh, it's, it's much more challenging to, to manage the conflict between the different uses. Uh, urban farming. Agriculture shouldn't just happen out there. Agriculture also should happen in the city. Urban farming, urban agriculture, am I at one minute on that? That's, my, that's about my last point, is urban agriculture. I think we need to, that's why I'm focusing on seeing it as a system. That agriculture just doesn't happen in the ALR lands or in the rural areas, but we need to support agriculture in the cities. There's tremendous opportunity in the cities for agriculture. I think Sandwich already allows backyard chickens. Support those smaller urban farms. <coughs> Require fruit trees and landscaping for new development. Uh, and support access to local food perhaps on-site sales even in the urban environment. Uh, and then my final comment is on the official community plan. The, the plan for Sandwich uh, has a lot of excellent, a lot of what I talked about is already in that plan in various ways, but to really make it happen it requires citizen involvement so that the elected officials know what's important. It's a living document and it requires citizens on an ongoing basis Citizens should be walking around with that plan when they, when they see new development proposed uh, or changes in amendments to a plan. It really needs a citizen support. Uh, it's a living document. It does change over time, and that is why we have variances and changes. So uh, that's my hogs, dogs, and frogs. And, and I, in a conclusion, I do hope that you can see this as three systems that, that we have to work together and can work together.
of identification, and in fact, of development of new communities, five of which are either entirely or partially in the Senate. So there's huge opportunities to take places like Douglas Corridor and so forth, and rework those entirely in large scale. And as you do it, you can pay attention to the problems.
Can everybody hear this? That's really loud. Okay, so do people have to, do I have to stand behind the speaker? Okay, I turned it down. That was the key. Now you can talk quietly. I, I just want to say that we, we did listen in Sandwich about the um, smart meter issue. It came forward to, uh, I'll go back and say our policy is that presentations come to our advisory committees. And so the smart meter issue did come before the environmental advisory committee, which I chair. And then it was going to be forwarded to council, which will possibly be next week. I believe it's on the schedule for next Monday. And UBCM has already passed that, so the, the motion is to go forward. If but, I could add to that, um, the decision as to how the process of putting smart meters in will unfold is entirely under provincial control and from mm -hmm. the province through BC Hydro, which is connected to the Corporate Ground Corporation. So uh, what we put forward is only suasive. Uh, the motion at UBCM only passed 55% to 45%. So it is quite possible the problems will look and say, well, there was no clear direction and so forth. And it is quite likely they will choose to ignore what councils have put forward. It is within their authority. Absolutely. I just wanted to make uh, aware that we, as a Sandwich Council, have, have, you know, have not ignored the, the passion of the public. And one thing back to the subdivision as well, the approving officer does have the final say, but there is every opportunity for residents to write letters pointing out issues that are of concern, and he will take that into consideration while making his decisions. Uh, well, it's a great thing to have so many incumbents and also people running here. So the question is for uh, elected officials as well as the panels has offered comments on uh, buying local, uh, ALR, and uh, uh, infrastructure for farming. So how can we increase that? Uh, essentially, uh, there, there's many programs that the provincial government should be enacting, such as um, by BC or local marketing. And so how would those programs benefit uh, local farmers and how can we incorporate that into planning? But also, what pressure can local governments bring to bear on the provincial government to encourage um, not only local farmers, but uh, also the marketing of that produce so that the farmers could get into a good market? So essentially, ALR and, and by BC type of a program. As I mentioned, I, I, looking at the critical success factors of food security, um, each one of them, and just creating awareness around it, writing more about it in the, in the newspapers, just um, bringing it to the universities, bringing it to our uh, district, to right through to the federal government, um, I just creating awareness. As, many, as much as we can. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Yeah, in terms of YBC, uh, I don't know what's going on currently right now, but as I'm thinking, questions come to mind is, is, is there any other municipal act or other provincial laws that provide uh, present obstacles and barriers right now to frustrate that? So are there opportunities for amendments, revisions, or, or new sections in that? And then on the spending side, either through direct grants and or on, on using the income tax system, tax credits, where you can target quite specific uh, sectors in the agricultural sector, and uh, you know, those can be quite precise and be a way of supporting and encouraging uh, family farmers. A few comments, and I, I'll just expand some of the um, some of the comments I made earlier. These are things that local government does have authority over, and that's, that's particularly through the zoning bylaw. Uh, there are things that can be done um, in a, areas that are already developed, uh, whether they're agricultural or urban. Um, we can support small-scale urban farms within the built-up area. It's possible to create a separate zoning category just for urban farms. Uh, and, and 
and have it reasonable enough that that farming activity can, can occur, even if it's a quarter acre. Uh, there are some special provisions, and I won't go into the detail here because we don't have time, but there are some very specific needs for small-scale farmers that zoning bylaws today simply wouldn't allow them to do. Uh, support community gardens, whether they're city-owned or district-owned. Um, allow on-site sales. Uh, and I'll give you an example of what I see would be a barrier. If I was required to provide a small parking lot or parking spaces in order to sell, that, that's a pretty big financial um, hit. Uh, I think that should be reconsidered if that's something that's it's in a bylaw. Um, all gardening in front yards. So it's just a sample of a few things that are within the power of local government. Okay, three hands up here, four hands, and then we're going to be uh, finished our questions. I, I'm Rob Wixon. I just wanted to answer that question a little bit more, too. In Gorge Tillicum area, we've had the Gorge Tillicum urban farmers now for the last two and a half years. And these guys are going around and farming land within the neighborhood. So they're going to a neighbor who might have a backyard that's not being used and asking them if they'd mind if we came in and farmed it. And they're doing that. And they're using the boulevards. And they're asking permission to use the boulevards. And But the, it's a grassroots thing. They're just doing it. Right? They're just going ahead and getting it done. They're trading produce, they're bringing produce down to the uh, different agencies that might need them. They're not necessarily selling things at the gate yet, but they would like to, and those kinds of things. They're building a network and they're building it from the ground up. That's where it starts. You've got to get going on that. But you also have to realize that you've got the neighbors next door saying they're putting vegetables on the boulevard. We don't want that. So you've got that discussion that needs to happen, and needs to happen in a very open and transparent way. And that's something we can do as politicians, is bring that discussion to the table. Now speaking of which, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of time, a time warning here. Okay, so, okay. 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 And so we have two over there, and then we have two on this side of the room. Yeah. You have to be succinct here. Harold Wolf again. Um, I'm, I'm really concerned. I mean, I love what's happening on the food uh, issue, the, the, the gardens, the, the, the small farms. Um, and I love the fact that almost every meeting I'm going to these days, food security comes up. It's, it's really getting into the public consciousness. But we're not tackling the real problem. The real problem is that you take a look at the ferries that pull up in the morning, and we get truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of food coming in here and being delivered to the grocery stores. That is where by far the most food is sold. And if that is ever interrupted, we are screwed on this island. We've got 300,000 people in the CRD and another 200,000 plus off island. Most of the food that we eat comes from off island. That's what we need to change. Everything we do at the, you know, the personal level in our backyards and in the community gardens and on, on a, a few farms, will increase the block from 5% to 10% to 15%. When, if the food supply is interrupted, we will starve. How can we start dealing with that? I know it may not be in the municipal element, but we have to jointly talk about it at all levels. Okay. Any quick questions on how we can, uh, how we can affect that? When you have a new slope called food starts here. <laughs> Vic Hughes, Tanich. My question is about people in the boat. You make reference to uh, getting the turnout. And my, uh, my uh, concept would be to uh, change the education focus in our newly coming in voters in the secondary school system and on our new situation across the region. We have to get at the idea to get involved and vote. As to running for council, you make reference to the acclamation of, I believe it was Highland, and then we had just had a few short elections ago, Esquimalt, that ran a claim. Do you have a, a question here? Yes, and in the, uh, in the question of getting people interested in running, or at least getting them interested in 
their civic issues, should we not be taking, especially in a situation like Senate, taking the city council meetings out of the city hall and taking them back to the community halls that we do our city council uh, candidate debates in? Why not? We need to address and bring the mountain to Muhammad or Muhammad to the mountain. So, so it sounds like two questions. One, how do we get people interested in two? City hall meetings be out in other parts of the community. So, brief response here from our panelists. What, what do you think about that? Would you like to talk about? Okay. Uh, first of all, I don't find, I, I don't necessarily think acclimations are inherently a problem. It depends on context. Uh, again, I always think of federally, provincially, we have of 300 IMPs, there's at least 100 of those seats or more that are safe for one party. And in fact, the other parties are putting out candidates, but it's a lost cause. To me, that's almost kind of a rough form of acclamation. You know who's going to win that seat. Now, we get fooled once more, it's a problem. So acclamations may say that people are generally satisfied, or it's a well-functioning council, or the, the mayor enjoys popular local support. So I don't lose sleep over that per se. But again, you need to talk about uh, more engagement with the community associations. I, I think Sandwich is one of the best in the region doing that already. I think this council is very open and accessible. You've got vibrant. Can you do better? Probably. Whoever, will people be happy? We'll always be discontented. That's politics. Uh, I think the challenge needs to be in other parts. Said that. I like your point though about in schools uh, and, in through, and I said earlier, families to talk about civics. And that's an old fashioned word, but that's what we're talking about. And the more people feel alienated, the authority. Occupy Wall Street, or the, the sense of <coughs> distance and disconnect uh, with large multinationals or large governments or global events. Here's an opportunity for some control, however modest. Even this shift to the shift, the on-island food production from five to six to seven, I think, uh, is trying to say, well, that's a 20% increase. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm afraid we ran out of questions right now. Um, but I do have, uh, I wanted to make a quick introduction. I believe we have a member of parliament who's arrived to join us for a little bit. Where do we go? Ah! Um, so the way that people... Are you going to name you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, you have, to, you have to introduce yourself, Brenda. Yeah, I'll be back. I'm Yama Garrison. Oh, she knows where I am. Sandwich course is my riding, but I do think municipal level is incredibly important. Yes. And so I'm here to right. say that again that people really need to focus on what municipalities can do. Yeah. Here. And now we have a couple of other candidates um, here. Shari, yeah. I think we have another couple of candidates here too as well. Yeah, we just arrived. Excellent. And if they would stand up and introduce themselves and tell us what you're running for. by design, and that is because after the refresh of the break, which is coming up shortly, we're going to be inviting you to join discussion groups, and, uh, and the organizers very wisely thought that color distribution would be a way to make that happen. So before you go away for your coffee, I want to reframe the question again to help you reflect on the comments from the panelists and from the, and from the audience, and here's the question. What makes for a good community, and how can we make it better? So that's the question you're going to be dealing with when you come back for the for the break. Fifteen minutes, there's coffee and, and cookies over there, so please help yourselves. Okay.